happening now on News Channel 5 at 6. Robert didn't deserve to leave here the way he left here. Robert Ricks died while in law enforcement custody in Alexandria in 2011. We're breaking down the case and the new attention it's getting over a decade later. Good evening and thanks for joining us for News Channel 5 at 6. I'm Brooke Buford. And I'm Alina Noakes. Early morning, February 6, 2011, 23-year-old Robert Ricks died at a local hospital after being taken to the Rapids Parish DC-1 jail just about an hour before. Ricks was to be booked after an incident the night of February 5th at his grandmother's house on Applewhite Street in Alexandria. It began as a medical call because Ricks was apparently having a seizure. And because Ricks died after an incident with law enforcement, Louisiana State Police investigated what happened and no criminal charges were filed. A year later, his father, Lawrence Ricks, filed a federal civil lawsuit for a violation of civil rights. The parties named as defendants included the agencies and people involved, as well as Taser International, because Ricks was tased by law enforcement twice the night of February 5th. And now more than 11 years later, Robert Ricks's case is in the spotlight again. A video was posted to YouTube on May 23rd, reportedly of new video of Ricks' encounter with law enforcement at the jail. That video spawned a letter a week later from his younger sister, Destiny Jones, to the U.S. Department of Justice, asking for the case to be reopened. We don't know. That's, that's what we're trying to figure out, how it turned from him being a patient to an arrestee. And for the past few weeks, our team has been pouring over hundreds of pages of documents from the case, including affidavits, medical reports, and expert testimony. Plus, more than an hour of surveillance video taken in the jail. Here's a recap of the case and what could happen next. Destiny Jones says her older brother, Robert Ricks, lived with his grandmother, Maxine Jones, at her home on Applewhite Street. He had literally moved back here to Alexandria. Now, it was like a year going into two years, like a year and a half that he had been back here. Ricks struggled with mental illness. He was diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia and bipolar, and he was going to outpatient services. And just three days before the incident with law enforcement, he was discharged from Crossroads. Number one. Around 9.30 p.m. on the night of February 5th, 2011, Rick's grandmother made a call to 911. A Cadian ambulance arrived at the scene first. A paramedic went in to assess Ricks, who was sitting in a recliner in the living room and in a report said he was very anxious, sweating, breathing heavily, and had dilated pupils. But he was awake and alert. The report states Ricks abruptly stood up and went to the back of the house, which led to Acadian crews becoming concerned about safety, deciding to wait outside for assistance. That's when the Alexandria Fire Department arrived. Captain Silton Matwire, who worked for the department, noted in a report that he had dealt with Ricks before in 2010, in which he noted, quote, Rick's behavior had been very combative and violent. Another firefighter noted in the report that Ricks had mutilated himself in the 2010 incident. And because of that prior incident, Matwire gave orders on February 5th for other firefighters and Acadian personnel to leave the home and called Alexandria police for backup. Rick's grandmother spoke with KALB back in 2011 about the incident. She died less than a year after her grandson's death. They said they weren't equipped to handle a, a person like that. The ambulance said. That's so I guess they must have called them policemen. Four members of APD arrived at the home. Officer Deidre Allen, Officer Marcus Kirk, Officer William Carmouche, and Sergeant Danny Joffreon. The four members of APD were told by Matoire about the 2010 incident with Ricks. Despite at least one of the officer's statements sharing that they were responding to a combative patient, there are no reports at this point in the night of Ricks being combative with anyone. At 10.12 p.m., the four officers entered the home and went to talk to Ricks in the back bedroom of the house. The following claims came from their statements given to Louisiana State Police just a week after Ricks' death. The officers described Ricks as restless, constantly changing clothes and looking through paperwork in the bedroom. Officers were with him between 45 minutes and an hour, attempting to get him to go to the hospital. Officer Carmouche, who was also a paramedic, shared that he saw Ricks with both antipsychotic and anti-anxiety medication. Two of the four said he was on the phone at one point with his girlfriend, who was also trying to get him to go to the hospital. His sister also said Ricks spoke with his older brother, Lawrence, while in the bedroom. Robert told him, Lawrence, 
I'm okay. I took my medicine. I don't know why they're here. The officers claim that Rick's grandmother told them she had a heart condition, was tired, and wanted him out of the house, but noted that she was a calming presence for Rick's in the back bedroom, with at least one officer claiming that Rick's clung to her as she walked him out of the bedroom. When they made it to the living room, officers claimed that Rick's became apprehensive when his grandmother shared that she was not going to the hospital with him. This is where their accounts of the situation start to differ. Officers Carmouche and Allen state that Ricks fell on top of his grandmother in a chair in the living room, but Sergeant Joffreon and Officer Kirk claim she was pushed into the chair by Ricks. All claim that Jones yelled for help to get Ricks off of her. At this point, three of the officers state that Ricks was removed from on top of Jones and was handcuffed, but Kirk says Ricks refused to get off and a struggle ensued before they handcuffed him. And that's when they took Ricks to the patrol car they was called out for medical attention and if my brother refused medical attention they should have left officer Carmouche states at that time ricks began to yell that the officers were going to beat him and that he had not been advised of his rights ricks then sat in the back seat of a police car with his legs still outside of the car officers state he would not put his feet inside adding that two knee strikes were performed to no avail all four state that Joffreon decided to drive stun ricks with a taser that means the cartridge was removed they all say after he was drive stunned he put his legs inside of the vehicle that's when they made their way to the DC-1 jail and not the hospital. So how did he end up at the jailhouse? And it's important to note that up until this point, only Officer Kirk states in his report to state police what Ricks would be charged with. And Kirk only stated that decision was made after Ricks was handcuffed and tased. From the house, all four APD members then got to the DC-1 jail with Ricks at 10.43 p.m., who was in Officer Kirk's squad car. From here, KALB has the surveillance video from inside and outside the jail from the moment Ricks arrived to when he left on a stretcher just over 30 minutes later. It's important to note our station obtained this video back in 2012 through the Freedom of Information Act. Although Ricks' family claims that until a recent viral video related to the case was released, they never saw this video. What video? So they told me what to go type in, and I go type it in, and I go and look, and this one... We see everything. We spoke with Carol Powell Lexing, who represented Ricks's father in a federal civil lawsuit in 2012, who confirmed to us that she asked for the video during discovery, but further questions about what she remembers from the case were difficult for her to answer, given that it was over a decade ago. Ricks was removed from the squad car at 10.48 p.m. when two Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office deputies, James Brunette and Jason Walker, came to assist APD. Once Ricks is walked toward the glass doors of the jail, the surveillance video shows Ricks pulling away from law enforcement, what Carmouche called, quote, kicking and jerking away in his statement. Ricks eventually fell to the ground with officers and deputies going down with him. Almost two minutes later, Ricks is picked back up. Remember, he's handcuffed and from there carried into the jail toward the elevator. Surveillance video shows that Ricks is carried for the rest of the time that he's in the jail. He was never set back up once they got him out their patrol car. And of course, he was afraid to get out of their patrol car because they had already been hitting and beating on him and tasering him. When they get to the fourth floor and get off the elevator, the group is met by Deputy Corey DeVille and then Deputy Mark Wood, who is now the sheriff of Rapids Parish. They continue to carry Ricks down the hallway before Ricks falls to the ground again. It's then that Wood kicks Ricks, but accounts differ on where Ricks is kicked. According to a statement from Wood, he kicked Ricks in the shoulder area. After seeing the video, which you see on your screen, Ricks' family disagrees and believes he was kicked in the head. All parties need to be held accountable, but for that in, in, in that video, you specifically kick a mentally ill person. That, that is not how that's supposed to go. Law enforcement is supposed to protect and serve us, and obviously we're not being protected if that's the type of treatment that you're getting.
In an affidavit taken two and a half years later, Wood said that at no point while Ricks was in the jail that he was informed Ricks was a schizophrenic or had suffered a seizure. They walked Ricks further down the hallway but had to continue to wait for the isolation cell to be cleared. During that time, multiple law enforcement accounts say Ricks was struggling. In an interview with Louisiana State Police, Deputy Brunette told investigators that he told Ricks that if he did not stop kicking and resisting, that he was going to tase him. Brunette stated that Ricks said he, quote, didn't give a damn and continued to kick. That's when Deputy Brunette took a taser away from Deputy DeVille and drive stunned Ricks for two to three seconds on his lower back. We do not have a clear video of when Ricks was tased, but Deputy Wood and Deputy Walker claimed that after being tased, Ricks said, okay, okay, I'm cool. Ricks' family shared that they're still confused as to why he was tased twice that night. I couldn't tell you what I, I, I really think in their head what was going on, but what I think is they abused their power in a sense of force was used. When the cell was cleared, Ricks was brought inside. At this point, we do not have a video from inside the cell. According to several law enforcement accounts, Ricks was found to be unresponsive. About a minute later, Officer Carmouche checked his pulse and determined he was not breathing. Carmouche, who was also a paramedic, told deputies to get the AED and call for a Cadian ambulance. While Carmouche began administering CPR, he sent Sergeant Joffrey on to get his medic bag from his patrol car. After that, Carmouche started an IV on Ricks and continued administering aid. Acadian arrived at 11.15 p.m. Ricks was brought out of the cell at 11.24 p.m. on a stretcher with a paramedic continuing chest compressions. Ricks was brought to Rapids Regional Medical Center where he was pronounced dead at 12.13 a.m. His official cause of death was excited delirium due to schizophrenia and cocaine toxicity following a struggle and the manner of death is listed as an accident. Excited delirium is a diagnosis of a potentially deadly state of agitation and delirium. It's also described as an overdose of adrenaline. According to Ricks' autopsy performed by pathologist Dr. Christopher Tape, Ricks had high levels of cocaine in his system. In Ricks' toxicology report, Dr. Michael Evans estimates Ricks had ingested a lethal dose of the drug. Dr. Tape goes on to say that cocaine use alone can be a cause of excited delirium, but so can schizophrenia, stating that, quote, most likely the schizophrenia and cocaine acted in common to initiate an excited delirium and death. The autopsy showed that Ricks' body also had signs of physiological stress. Dr. Tape adds in his report that being tased would raise a person's hormones in response to stress and that those same hormones are at their peak a few minutes after a struggle and deaths attributed to excited delirium, but states that taser devices are not likely to be a cause of death. If you look online, Look up the taser deaths. Anybody that have died after being tased, they're going to use their term excited delirium. It's important to note in the present day, some consider excited delirium to be a controversial diagnosis and is not widely recognized by many health organizations. But in the toxicology report, Dr. Evans noted Ricks exhibited several signs of excited delirium during interactions with law enforcement. According to the Alexandria Police Department's policy and procedure use for taser use, officers must be aware of a subject's condition, including if the subject is in a state of excited delirium, quote, prior to being tased, adding that those exhibiting excited delirium should be transported to the nearest medical facility as soon as possible. And as we know, Ricks ended up being taken to the jail instead and was tased twice that night, despite apparently showing signs of excited delirium. And by the time the lawsuit filed by Robert Ricks' father came to a conclusion in the summer of 2015, only Taser International remained as a defendant. The others were dismissed by Judge D. Drell through motions over the years. On June 4, 2015, a jury sided with Taser International and the claims against the company were dismissed. Now, more than a decade later, after the night her brother died, Destiny Jones is hoping that her letter to the U.S. Department of Justice may lead to it being reopened, this time by the FBI. She also wants criminal charges filed and is calling on those in law enforcement who were there that night, including now Sheriff Mark Wood, to step down. We reached out to Sheriff Wood for comment on Destiny Jones' letter and claims and received this statement from his office. It reads, quote, all facts were presented in federal court and a federal judge has ruled that no one did anything wrong in the handling of this matter. And Jones is optimistic that she'll hear back on her letter and the people she sent it to, including Governor John Bell Edwards, Attorney General Jeff Landry, and the legislative members investigating the Ronald Green case. I expect to hear something back. There's no way this can go unnoticed. It's too much evidence that's out there, uh, especially with this video footage showing 
the conduct, the mishandling conduct of a mentally ill man. Jones tells us she's in the process of looking for an attorney to represent her. There's no word yet on if the FBI will accept the case and re-examine it. We'll be